Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Disco Elysium with me, Brankaton. So last episode, I walked right past Tommy here, who was saying, Hey officer, got a minute? So let's speak to him. I, uh, saw you poking around in Lady Driver's lorry. She in trouble? Uh, no trouble. She's gonna be fine. Oh man, that's like a load off my mind. All that stress was messing up my rhymes. He chooses to believe what's best for her. What's the plan with those rhymes anyway? Oh, you know. Tommy Leham's gonna be a musician. Sprechgesang, but with beats. I've got a lot of free time on the road to hone my craft. The thought lightens him up. Now why Tommy Lahome? Tommy Lahome was taken. My real name's Jerry Lafitte. Tommy's way better. He shrugs in a what can you do manner. Alright, I had another question actually. The man taps his fingers rhythmically against his arm. Nope, that's it. Alright, let's go speak to Joyce now. Now if we completed this task for her, then we can confront the Hardy Boys about... The Lady Driver. Curtains shift, just a little. Someone is watching from within. You're back. Good. What can I help you with? She takes a sip from her silvery thermal cup. I spoke with the loreman at the roundabout. Yes, my eyes on the harbor have sent word to that effect. What have you discovered? Well, first things first. New thought. I'm going to do the regular law official. I think that sounds the best. Each one of these requires minus two to one of my skills, which I'm not happy about. But I'm going to rip off the band-aid of the minus two to Inland Empire. Because we do get a lot of checks for that, so I'm not really excited about this. But, to get it out of the way early on, let's go and do it. Wait, where exactly are these eyes located? It doesn't really matter, and I do apologize for the surveillance. Wild Pines can't afford to be blind at a time like this. One of the tall buildings overlooking the roundabout, most likely. That would give them a read on the entire quarter. In any case, it's a relief to know someone has looked into it. If I may ask, will there be an official investigation? I assume you discovered there is an operation. If there is an investigation, it will be part of an ongoing operation, subject to confidentiality. I am sure you understand. Of course, detectives. In any case, you've held up your end of our arrangement. I trust you with the rest. Now it's my turn. She says, her tone more cautious suddenly. I wouldn't normally break protocol like this, but the situation demands it. If you don't solve this murder, I'm afraid we may have a bloodbath on our hands. The words bloodbath sound cold in her mouth. They taste of iron and strawberries. What was that about a bloodbath? Yes. I'm afraid this strike may descend into a small-scale civil war, with possible consequences for all of Rivershall West. Since you are sharing, man, this is also the RCM's worst-case scenario. Then we're on the same page, as grim as it may be. I've already heard about a connection between the lynching and strike, but I need your testimony. I have an indirect role to play, I'm sad to say. My employer experienced a momentary lapse of faith in me. In that moment, they elected to deploy a private military contractor as an insurance measure. They called it my security detail. A momentary lapse of faith. They were dispatched after I relayed the union's initial offer. Every worker 
a member of the board. I tried to convince my employer it was simply a piece of rhetoric or a joke. They did not appreciate the humor. She nods. Do you need a security detail? Absolutely not. These mercenaries are muscle, pure and simple. They are meant to intimidate the Union into surrendering. Who are they, exactly? Cronel, an Oranese military company. As far as I know, three arrived in Martinez. They report to me sporadically, but they do not answer to me. To be frank, our relationship is deteriorating. They wear ceramic armor, have semi-automatic weapons and years of combat experience. They also have trauma and stressor disorder, and no idea how to conduct themselves in an urban civilian environment. So, what happened? The story is, one of them, the Colonel, I don't know his real name, sexually assaulted a local woman while he was drunk and separated from his unit. This allowed some of the more militant Union members to subdue him. He was taken out behind the whirling in rags and lynched last Sunday night. What then? Nothing. Mr. Clare refuses to let me into the harbor. I have not been able to discuss this matter with anyone there. The remaining two Cronell contractors carry out their orders, for now. For now? It's a smokescreen. In secret, they are conducting an independent military tribunal into the lynching. Once this investigation is concluded, executions will follow. What is the nature of this so-called investigation? Whether to execute one, some, or all of the Union militants. Yeah, boy oh boy, is that not good? It's not good, no. My only hope is that you provide a single concrete suspect before the mercenaries indiscriminately pick theirs. Simply put. A wave crashes against the side of her boat. As she, and she grabs hold of the mainsail. If you don't pin this on someone good and do it fast, they will identify and execute everyone present at the lynching. This in turn will force the Union to respond. The debarder have over 2,000 men. It will be a thousand to one. Have you ever seen a hornet invade a beehive, Lieutenant? It's not pretty. She leans back. The Serai's giant hornet, the world's second largest insect, can kill 40 honeybees a minute, while a group of 30 can decimate an entire hive of 20,000 bees in less than four hours. These men work in tandem using semi and fully automatic firearms. Their armor is virtually impenetrable to muzzle-loaded weapons, even yours. Most Union workers don't have guns at all. As I said, a bloodbath. She's silent for a moment, then concludes. Isn't this a pretty bleak scenario you're describing? Many bleak scenarios have already come true. Nameless, badgerless detective of the citizens' militia. She looks at you, eyes damp from the wind. All we can do is keep the rest from going the same way. One single concrete suspect delivered into civil court, and I may be able to defuse this situation. What can you tell me about Crennel? Not much. Their public resume is relatively good as far as private military contractors go. I believe they were once called Downwell. They boast a long list of clients. Saint-Baptiste, Welchman Lorenz, Eendracht. A warning sign, however. The operations concerned all take place in third or fourth world countries. Guarding facilities, escort missions and such. Meaning they're used to operating in war zones. Yes, all the good conflict corridors Supramundi, Yesut, the Seminese Islands, countries that don't have a good record reporting atrocious military conduct on their soil. Okay. Anything else you got on them? Sadly, no. Before this happened, I had little interest in them. Now that I do, I don't have the resources. She thinks. If you still have access to the ICP's database, you could run a better background check than I ever could. It may take some time, though. She thinks. Do you know a lot about the inner workings of the RCM and the ICP, ma'am? In my line of work, it pays to do your research. I was prepared to deal with the RCM. I did not think I'd be dealing with a group like Cronell. Can you contact the company? Tell them to, tell them to call them off. I have. 
and they will. However, these orders take time to reach what is basically a rogue unit out in the field here. Until they do, it's all on us. She's being truthful. She is pressing them as hard as she can. You said the deceased assaulted a woman. Or he didn't. This is information passed on to me from some teenagers loitering around the canal. I cannot testify by it. She tilts her head. Who did the passing on then? The remaining contractors. Their tribunal. It's what they believe. What do these teenagers by the canal say? That the man was killed because he assaulted a local woman. I've asked around a bit. This seems to be the accepted story around Martinez. The lieutenant consults his notebook, his eyebrows knitted in concentration. Odd. We haven't heard any reports about an assault in connection with the lynching. Where did it take place? And when? Last Sunday night, at the Whirling in Rags, the hostel by the gates. Supposedly, the colonel was drunk, maybe on narcotics, too. Either way, he's alleged to have sexually assaulted a woman. Sometime later, a group of dock workers got their hands on him. And who was this woman? That's a good question, officer. I don't have the slightest idea. As I said, it's a rumor about a rumor. In any case, it's what the colonel's remaining colleagues believe. You meet her soon enough, you feel. Now oh, this colonel, the one who was hanged, did you know him? If you mean did I see him alive, yes. But I did not know him. His name was? Lely, his service name, a nom de guerre, most likely. He wouldn't divulge his full name. Only one of them did. A bad sign if there ever was one. Tell me about the others first. One is a man. Corty, they call him. A nickname as well. The other a woman, Phyllis de Paul. Corty is the gunner, I believe. De Paul is a radio operator. What would you say was his eye color? The deceased. Lieutenant cuts in. She closes her eyes, trying to picture the man's face. Then, shakes her head. I can't remember. There's a pang of regret to her voice. The lieutenant was testing her, asking a small detail first to see if she knew him better than she let on. She passed. That's all right, then. Anything else? Nationality? What would you say was his age? He was 40. Or 50. It's hard to say which. He had a combat injury on his lower jaw. It made it difficult to estimate his age, or gauge his spatial expressions. What else? Nationality? Accent? He was, uh, Occidental, I think. Light brown hair, a mixed accent. Oranese. Or Mycenaean, maybe. His injury gave him an accent all his own. In a way, it was humanizing. He had to learn to speak through it. Through the injury. That's all I know, I guess. I only met him once. She nods. Where are the remaining two mercs now? They've gone to ground, as it were. I don't recommend seeking them out. For one, they're almost certainly armed to the teeth. She puts her foot on the guard wire for balance. They don't have the same respect for the Revachol citizens' militia as I do. To put it bluntly, they think you're vigilantes. Ghetto savages. It will not be a fruitful meeting. We still need to know where they are. You're likely to run into them eventually. When that happens, I'll be in a better position to mediate if I don't appear involved. Someone you haven't met. It's a red check. Well, let's try it anyway. 72% chance is pretty good. One must be at the harbor gates, causing trouble. Directing strike breakers, perhaps. You can hear the sounds of the ruckus coming from there all the time. The other has a vantage point in a building south of the roundabout. They were keeping tabs on you while you were canvassing the lorry drivers. I'm thinking the company put one leading strike breakers at the gate. What do you think? That may be so. I still hope you heed my advice. There's no need to kick the hornet's nest. She is poised and unperturbed. For all your talk of averting this catastrophe, the situation at the gate is a border keg. Does this not bother you? Of course it bothers me, Lieutenant, but my hands are tied. How would my employer react if it appeared I were intervening on behalf of the Union? 
Your concern may be appearances. Ours is keeping the peace. One is probably in a building overlooking the roundabout. That would afford a good vantage point. In any case, it's practically inaccessible. She says. Where is your radio for contacting them, if I may ask? Do you have an earpiece? Heavens no. I'm not an undercover agent. There's a short wave at the ship's wheel. She nods towards the sloop's cabin. I had another question for you. I hope I can answer it better. How much time do we have? Until the executions start. Truthfully, I don't know. It depends on their progress identifying the members of the lynch mob and their impatience. They don't report their progress to you? Not on this matter. I'm afraid they consider this a personal initiative. There's a brief silence. Seagulls squawk over the bay. It's a matter of days, not weeks. Well, that's enough for now. I am sorry to have been the bearer of bad news. If there is anything else I can help you with, please ask. Now, can you tell me about these tattoos? Show her the photo. Of course. Excuse my hesitation before. She reaches over the guard wire and takes the photo. Holds it in her hand. For about half a minute, in silence. It was taken with a trigger not long ago. This is the man's upper body. There were no more markings on his hands or legs. Stay quiet. Observe the woman's expression. Her mouth is relaxed. The accordion lines near her mouth vanish. The pearls of her eyes move slowly on the photo's surface. What do you think? Uh, sorry. I was trying to see if I can read the web of interdependencies between these points. The stars. She breaks her concentration, and then she points to one, one on the photo paper. I can't. But that's how you read this story. The points themselves don't have letters, numbers, anything. Their size, location on the body, and distance from each other tells you what they represent. Like stars in the sky. Close. Port cities. This is an Oranese map of the waterways, a sailor's tattoo worn by wayfarers of the Dolorian century. Over 300 years ago, the sailors would mark their bodies to map their travels. She nods. What is the use of this map? The sailor's soul would use it to fly back home if they should die abroad. This is a sort of contraption to be reeled back in by. The silver cord, they would call it. What travels did the, did the dead man make? Quite a few. Vredefort, the Oranese capital, traditionally stands on the right shoulder. He started somewhere near here, I think. She points to it on the photo. What next? Then he made his way to the Preto Grangi, through what I think must be the Stutz Canal, an artificial channel through the Occident. From the Preto, he sailed to the Insulindic Ocean, first the Semenese Islands, then this. She points to his heart. What is that? Revachol. Those are the two constants. Redefort on the shoulder, and Revachol in the heart. They started the tradition of these maps right after the discovery of Insulinde, at the dawn of the inter age. The old, old world passing by, and the new, new world already here. You said you can't read it. I can't. This man was no sailor, and these are no ports. I can understand geographic fragments, but not their meaning. Who could tell me more? His platoon members? The other contractors, though I do not suggest you go and show them that picture. This man was their friend and comrade. Surely there are other people to ask about the tattoo. This is not necessary to complete the task, officer. It's a dangerous side task. Search elsewhere. I need the information. Mark it down. Ask Mercs about tattoos. Do what you have to do, detective. I don't think deciphering that tattoo should come before public security, but if you should wade into the mob to find out, I couldn't stop you. We will be careful, ma'am. That's all for the tattoos. Thank you for your help. Is there anything else I can help you with? She hands, back, hands you back the photo. Oh, thank you. That's all for now. I do believe that is all for now. Right, let's go talk to the Hardy Boys.
Have we run across anybody who would be familiar with the map? I haven't met any sailor type. Oh, the bookkeeper. She has maps in her store. Maybe. Hello again, esteemed officer. Several maps have been attached. The maps look old and faded. Nope, no new options here. So let's just go talk to the Hardy Boys and I guess we'll figure that this out another time. This is new. You see a set of tire tracks in the brown slush that covers the plaza mosaic. Why am I looking at this? Cop habit. You look at everything. This isn't case related, you think. What kind of vehicle drove through here? Hard to say. Reconstruct the movement. The tire tracks were left here by an unknown event that took place some days ago. It's a message, written in the language of burnt rubber. Some of that rubber stuck to the tiles right in front of the whirling in rags. This is point A. The driver started there, and then accelerated straight into the fence, left a hole big enough for the Franco-Nigerian cavalry, according to the cafeteria manager. What happened next? The driver proceeded to back out of the yard, barely stopping before hitting the adjacent building. Before heading south. Must have been in a hurry. A car drove through the fence. You are correct. This is a rather motor carriage friendly city. Alright, let's go and do this as well. Not really looking forward to having minus two an encyclopedia or minus two to visual calculus. I think visual calculus is more valuable for skill checks, so I'm going to do that first to get it taken care of early on. And hope for the best. <laughs> Somehow that makes you feel scared. You don't know why. Is this connected to the case? I'm not sure. There are plenty of traffic accidents waiting to happen in Martinez. With the jam right here on the roundabout, I would keep them separate. You could follow the track south. There seems to be a canal there. See where they went, if you find the time. I think I got it. Maybe we can just follow it real fast. So I guess that plus two to perception. It's adding a lot of checks. A lot of checks around the world. I should probably go back through everywhere we've been. Butter sign down. A crumpled billboard reading, Samaran butter soaks in the canal. Two ugly lines mar the bright countenance of the blonde boy depicted. What is Samar and Butter? Whatever it is, the boy on the billboard seems very happy about it. Goat milk and butter. The Samaran terrain makes it easier to raise goats than cows. And the local goat farmers produce high quality meat and dairy staples that add variety to other nations' diets. It's an acquired taste. All right, uh, attempt to reconstruct what happened here. Judging by the size of the impact and the parallel lines of burnt rubber, the cause was probably a motor vehicle. These look like the same tire tracks I saw earlier, in front of the whirling rags. Look at the crater. 
Side slip marks indicated that the vehicle was traveling up the crater at 35 kilometers an hour. Look at the roof of this shack. The black marks on the roof indicate that the vehicle vaulted from the crater to the roof of the shack. Look at the slipping metal roof panel. The panel served as a takeoff ramp. Look at the broken posts. The vehicle soared through the air, hitting the billboard and upsetting the posts. Then it continued its flight, taking the billboard with it. Look at the sign. The sign broke the vehicle's fall into the canal. The Samarin Butter billboard still looks freshly painted, suggesting it took the plunge recently. How recently? Within the past 72 hours. Look at the opposite bank. Still speeding, the vehicle made a loop and vanished into the fog along the coast. What was the model of this phantom vehicle? There are two good candidates. The Cuprise 40 and the Linear G22. Why the Cupri 40? It's about the right size. And the tire marks look like they came from the skinny tires frequently found on that motor carriage. The Caprice 40 is a very popular model, with bank clerks, topping pie delivery drivers, secondary school teachers, cops, strippers dressed as cops, undressed strippers. Why the Linear G22? Very sturdy but light motor carriage. More likely than most to survive that jump. The Linear G22 is not a particularly popular model due to its peculiar proportions which the manufacturer's design team probably thought about for too long what now you'd have to follow the tracks to be sure blink the lieutenant looks on waiting for you to wrap up your analysis any theories about what happened here he gazes down at the sign he looks like someone was in a real hurry what kind of car do you think it was? Hmm. You believe it was a, a I think it's pronounced Lene? Lene G22? That's quite likely, from what I can tell. He seems impressed. I have some ideas about who it might have might have been. Oh. He raises his eyebrows. Had to be someone really cool and courageous. I suppose that narrows it down somewhat. Fortunately, we are not traffic cops. Should we get back to the murder? Uh, try to come up with a convincing explanation for the driver's actions. I don't think I've ever succeeded in conceptualization uh, dice roll, so let's, let's hope. It's a red check, so... Somewhere in the depths of your alcohol-addled soul, you find a few threads that you can weave into a story. This could have only been, pause dramatically, Jacob Err. The tip-top tourney champion? After the untimely death of dear friend and fellow racer, Afi Delatraz at Fjordhammer, Jacob Err was desperately chasing death on the racetrack, but death eluded him. The lieutenant patiently listens to the words coming from your mouth. After quitting in frustration, he became a recluse, a ghost driver, searching for death on the streets of Revachol, speeding. Jumping canals at night? If I was Jacob Irv, I wouldn't drive in Martinez. The roads are awful. He interrupts you. In conclusion, it's a colorful theory, but I don't believe Jacob Irv did this. Should we go? No. We need to find this Jacob Irv before tragedy strikes. Take the task. <sighs> if we must. He sighs. I'm not expecting him to get far with this. The lieutenant consoles himself. You know, I'm just taking a real quick peek inside here with my new plus two to perception. Ah, see? Wow, a very large red t shirt with an impressive print stands out from the other garb. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. The print depicts a muscled man striding toward you, a giant sword in each hand, encircled by burning embers. Behind him 
is a cluster of cabins engulfed in flames. Beneath him are the words, Hyeom Dal burning. Sniff the t-shirt. Smells like worn cotton and a little old sweat there. Worn cotton with a side of flea market or trash bin. Sniffing is okay, but please don't try anything on. Can't have you leaving your photon emissions in the fabric of things you're not going to buy. You're not imagining it. Photon emissions? What is he talking about? Uh, I missed this. Uh, says the shopkeep. There's a rad man from Hyomdal's t-shirt you've got there. Hell yeah, man. I don't usually carry printed tees, but this one was just pure exemplar. The shopkeep sounds enthusiastic. We have a lot in common. I'm a big fan of the man from Hyomdal too. I wouldn't go so far as to say that I'm a fan. But I do think the Hyom Dalaman saga is an integral part of our shared reality. He grimaces. Most people don't think that the man from Hyomdal really existed. But they're wrong. What do you mean the man from Hyomdal was real? I mean, even if the man from Hyomdal didn't exist before the adventure novels, the stories have made it so that he has. It's simple, really. Okay. He sounds incredulous. You sound skeptical. It's not that complicated. All that's required is a more robust understanding of cause and effect. Besides, I've been to Kotla, though not quite as far north as the Hjelmdal, and watched northern lights travel across the sky. Very unique energetic tides there. His theory isn't exactly incoherent. But its logic does suggest some unusual neural activity. Interesting. Very, very unique energies, indeed. Geomagnetic ley lines, one might even say. How much are you selling this t-shirt for? Two real. That's dirt cheap. Lieutenant raises his eyebrows. Can you just give it to me for free then? But why? He frowns. Uh, perhaps I could repay you in some other way. Our dealing goods, not services. You know what? Let's buy it. Okay, I thought it over, and I want to buy the t-shirt. Welcome to Hjelmdal, officer. Well, let's take a look at it. The man from Hjelmdal is standing in front of a burning village, dueling his ever-present Zweihanders. His muscles look ready to burst out of the two-dimensional print and into your three-dimensional life. And compared to what I currently have on. Gives me physical instrument and shivers. Minus two authority. I think my authority is already zero, isn't it? Yeah, we're already at zero. So it wouldn't hurt to have that equipped, would it? Alright, so it's definitely worth going through some of these other buildings now that we have that plus two to perception. So I think next episode we'll start by talking to the Hardy Boys, but then we'll go back through the um, the area behind the bookstore and see if we can't find anything new back there. Is there just a lot of new checks around, and like significant checks at that, not just like little uh, orbs, but like actual dialogue checks. Don't see anything new in here. Let's check the door real fast. Then we'll notice something new about the door. You see a hip. Nope. Okay. Alright, I'm gonna call it here, and the next one will speak to Titus first thing about What do we find out? Oh, about the uh the lady driver. Then we'll probably go back through the dilapidated business building. See if there's any new perception checks back there. And then maybe finally head east to, to deal with the protests in the union. I keep getting uh keep getting sidetracked. Which is which is fun. So anyway, thanks for watching. I hope to see you guys in the next one.